Um, I'm Chris Kellner from Mount Sinai. I do a lot of minimally invasive ICH evacuation, but it's mostly endoscopic or surgiscopic. So I'm gonna give you a few of those details. And as uh, Gustavo was telling you, I'll give you some updates on the trials, looking at those types of techniques. Here are my conflicts of interest. Uh, you can see I'm involved in a lot of the trials evaluating surgiscopic and endoscopic techniques. I'll start with acknowledgements. And I think the conflicts and acknowledgements are kind of similar here. And the acknowledgements are to the companies that have spent uh, a lot of time and effort and money to figure this disease out. So appreciation to all of them. Uh, last time I was here, I put this up and talked about our battle against ICH and uh, maybe even identified a few of the leaders in the ICH field here. Um, and I've been kind of thinking that maybe it's more like Voltron. Maybe we're all putting together little pieces. And so I'm going to go through the trials and talk about the little nuggets of information and, and what we've each added to these. And maybe the speaker after me will talk about what else we can do uh, and, and try and fight this disease. So what is the status? We heard a little bit about this in the last uh, talk going, going in the guidelines. So I'm not going to go through those details again, but it's exciting to see that there's a little bit more room for minimally invasive ICH evacuation after the MISTI results came out. The major questions that we have to answer here are, should we even take out the clot? We're still working on, does taking out the clot improve functional outcome? We think it improves mortality through some techniques. Um, and there's a lot of evidence, there are a lot of clinical trials out there that I think have been criticized for uh, various uh, aspects of the methodology. The 17 uh, randomized clinical trials that look at different techniques, not the modern ones, but the older ones, um, even some of those were positive, but we're still evaluating whether or not the outcomes of those trials should be taken with level one evidence. As you saw in the guidelines, it's really taken as level two evidence. So should we take out the clot? We're still working on that. How should we take it out? I'm going to go through some of the details on the large array of options for that. Um, and when, when should we take it out? There's a lot of debate about this. I think everyone in the audience here uh, realizes the benefit of taking out the clot early, as Gustavo was mentioning, but I don't think that's a universally accepted um, truth. And then we'll hear next, what should we do after we take out the clot? So let's go into this a little bit. We know that open craniotomy is not effective, uh, and we saw that from stitch one and stitch two. We also learned early on that if we try to do a craniotomy for an ultra early clot, we run into trouble and there's bleeding in the procedure that can lead to increased mortality associated with trying to take out the clot early. So that's something that we take very seriously in minimally invasive evacuation studies and try to make sure that this is as safe as possible. This is a hindrance that uh, the thrombectomy studies had less uh, of an issue dealing with. There wasn't this major safety concern uh, in the thrombectomy studies when all those studies were working on trying to figure out how to get the procedure done effectively. Um, but instead, we, we do have this safety concern. Maybe going earlier is less safe than going later. Uh, and so some of the trials, especially the endoscopic trials in MISTI, have looked at a later time point. Uh, these are the large number of trials I was, I was telling you about in which uh, the overall, overall, they do indicate that there might be a benefit. But I think the quality of these trials uh, limits the ability to give this a solid level one recommendation. We've learned a lot from MISTI two and three. And so we heard about that last time. So I'm gonna just kind of breeze through this a little bit. Um, and then how should we take it out? And so this is, I think really the value that I can bring to this conversation here is uh, looking at the different types of evacuation. On the top left there, you see you've got MISTI. Um, I think everyone here knows what that technique is. Then you've got the craniopuncture technique, which was that uh, really interesting and, and very strongly positive trial from 2008 from China. Um, and then we've got endoscopic assist. Some of our colleagues in Asia are regularly doing this and have really published some amazing data on it. And I'm going to show you one of those papers. Um, and then we've got endoscopic in the bottom middle, and then we've got uh, endoport mediated in the bottom right, which everyone here is familiar with. Um, so let's talk about the benefits and the disadvantages. I think there could be a lot of debate, so I'll just give you my opinion here. And I think we can all uh, consider what we think is, is the benefits and uh, uh, disadvantages of each technique. So the MISI technique is very feasible. You're basically putting an EBD catheter into a clot. And um, it is something that has a 
easier learning curve than the other techniques. There's a robust clinical experience. Many centers are doing this regularly, and there's a lot of clinical evidence already in support of this in some situations. The, prof the cannula itself is very low profile. It's, it's 4.5 French, uh, putting that sheath in and then putting the EVD through it. Um, some of the disadvantages are that the published data suggests that it's effect, it hits its surgical endpoint only 60% of the time approximately. You have to be very selective when you're identifying which patients you can do this for. You've got to make sure the clot's stable so you can't go in there and get a spot sign patient or a patient expanding like you can with some of the other techniques. Um, so you can't address expansion. So that does limit the applicability of this technique. Here are the trials that have been done for this, MISTI-2 and MISTI-3, and there's some talk about MISTI-4, although I, haven't, uh, I don't have any details on that, so I can't go into that in detail. Um, of course, everybody here knows endoport-mediated technique. You can use bimanual technique. You've got great visibility. Um, you can broadly apply this to a wide range of patients. Um, it's less minimally invasive than the MISTI technique and the endoscopic techniques. There's less evidence of support than MISTI, although we just heard we're about to have some, some evidence in the near future. Um, and it requires more training, probably than the MISTI technique, but probably less than the other techniques I'm gonna show you. Um, endoscopic assist, not something we hear a lot about around here in these here parts, but uh, this is something that Abel Huang, for example, in Taiwan does regularly and has published on. And uh, some of those results are some of the best early results in the literature. So I'll show you that paper next. Um, in that paper, uh, you've got great visibility through the endoscope. Uh, you can apply this broadly, just like you can with uh, endoport mediated. It's less minimally invasive than uh, the MISI technique. It's a one centimeter sheath, clear sheath that they use. Uh, there's less evidence in support. There's no large trial looking at this. Um, and it requires a little bit more training, probably than MISI and probably also than endoport mediated. You've got uh, the endoscope down there. You've also got an instrument, a multifunctional cannula next to the endoscope. Here's the, the paper I was referring to from 2011, really an excellent paper. This was a series of 68 early evacuations in which 84% of them were within four hours. All of them were within 12 hours, but 84% were in within, uh, within four hours. Here are the results that they showed. Um, they had a median evacuation rate of, of 93, as you can see on the right there, and they had a rebleeding rate of 1.5%. So this shows, this is published evidence that going in early, you, and if you can address bleeding and address the clot and get the clot out, you can do it safely. So this is a, uh, this refutes the Morgan Stern et al. paper I was just showing you a few minutes ago. And I think that's because with the minimally invasive technique, uh, just like with Endoport, uh, and with this technique, if you get in there and there's something bleeding, you can address it with, with, an with a cautery instrument. And you also have really good visibility in the cavity. So you can identify the bleeder and, and stop it in a way that maybe you couldn't with a craniotomy from that 2001 paper. Now let's get to endoscopic, uh, something that I do quite a bit and, uh, and have a lot of experience with. Um, early evacuation potential, you can do it. It's more challenging to learn than the other techniques I just mentioned. Um, you've got to be a lot more patient. I'm going to show you some videos from that. Um, but you can get very good visibility once you clear out the blood. And you can broadly select patients. We have very broad selection criteria in our institution. Um, it's less minimally invasive than the MISTI technique, but with a 6.3 French sheath, it is fairly minimally invasive. There's less evidence and support, but we have lots of trials ongoing. And I'm going to show you uh, a summary of those in a few minutes. Um, and it does require quite a bit of training to get used to using this technique. You have to be familiar with the endoscope and also specifically with the technique. Here are the trials uh, that are completed and ongoing. The two completed trials, we don't have results from yet, um, but they should be coming out very soon for both of those. The INVEST study, Jay Maka was the PI. That was a 50 patient single arm feasibility study looking at clots greater than 30 cc's uh, and those, that evacuation needed a stability scan and then also needed to occur within 72 hours. So definitely not an early evacuation study. And we're going to be hearing those results pretty soon uh, in the next few months. MIND is a randomized trial looking at clots greater than 20 cc's within 72 hours. Initially, all clots supertentorial were included, but then this, uh, then the lamics were excluded later in the study. Um, they've enrolled greater than 180 patients at this point, and there is an interim analysis at, two, at, at 200. So there might be some information coming out in the short term uh, with some results from this study. 
And then the Dutch intracerebral hemorrhage surgery trial is something very interesting. I, a lot of people haven't heard a lot about this, um, but this has been going on in the Netherlands for a few years. Um, this is an early evacuation endoscopic study. So it's within eight hours. It's a very broad criteria, uh, plots greater than 10 cc's. So much smaller than we're used to doing here. And also patients with a stroke scale of two or greater. So some patients are doing pretty well and still getting an evacuation in this group. Um, so a little different from the approach in the United States, um, but I think very interesting in that it's an early, a true early evacuation within eight hours. This is the earliest study ongoing at the, at the moment. They completed their enrollment of the pilot study. Then they're now uh, reviewing those results and will submit and apply for funding for a larger randomized clinical trial. I don't have more details than that, but I think those results will, will be coming out pretty soon. I'm gonna show you a little bit about what we've been doing at Mount Sinai with the scuba technique. <clears throat> um, and this is the endoscopic technique that uh, Dr. Mako and I uh, developed and we employed, but it's really just trying to describe how you do an endoscopic evacuation. We do these all in the angiography suite. Uh, we prefer the angiography suite because we treat these patients like acute stroke patients. And we use the same acute stroke team. They love coming in at midnight, unlike other surgical teams uh, or other teams. So. Um, it, and we have full control of the angio suite. So, uh, it's a, it's a good setup for us. Um, and using the EM, uh, system, we're able to get stereotactic navigation there, um, and can do the procedures comfortably that way. Um, there's the incision. I think I'll just go through this. The crowd here, I think is familiar with most of this stuff here. So, um, it's a three port endoscope that we use. Um, and there's the, uh, the size of that. Entire procedure is done through that with an adjunctive instrument uh, down the working channel. Um, early on in the experience, we were using the Apollo exclusively. Then the Apollo was superseded by the Artemis, which you can see here in this picture. Um, the Artemis is a long uh, wand, about two millimeters in diameter, and it's got a spinning bident at the tip. So you're able to morselate clot. You're not able to cut clot like with the Nicomurian, but you're able to morselate it uh, and it can handle most clots uh, in that fashion. And you activate that by pressing the button there. It's red. Um, and you can also um, activate suction by pressing that, that button there. So here that is, go here that is going down the working channel. Uh, and the technique we've been using is uh, evacuating as much of the clot at each depth and then slowly pulling back the endoscope, uh, clearing out each, maybe each centimeter depth, getting back to the proximal end of the clot and then irrigating, uh, and then at, when you have visibility irrigating, going after residual clot and going after residual bleeders. Um, and so I'll just show you a case here. This is a published case um, that I showed last time I was here as well. Uh, I think it just, I showed this because it was an early evacuation and it kind of shows you uh, the difficulty of uh, the challenge of, of doing an endoscopic evacuation when there's bleeding, but also shows you that with some patients you can get through it. So here's the trajectory for a right frontal 30 cc clot and here's your initial view. That white circle on the outside is the sheath. So you're inside the sheath. That's the Artemis aspiration device coming out and you're looking through the endoscope here. So once you remove a little bit of clot, you can see that this patient had expanded and I think probably would have continued to expand because right when we evacuated that small piece of clot, now the sheath is inside the clot and you're getting active bleeding coming out. So this was an active situation we went into. Um, and then after 20 minutes of continuous irrigation with lactated ringers, and while also irrigating, you're aspirating with the Artemis, any, any other clot that you see, uh, during the procedure. So you're continually irrigating new blood out, uh, and you're aspirating, uh, thick blood, uh, during the procedure. So here's 40 minutes of the procedure. Now you've got much better visibility and can even hone in on where the bleeding is coming from. You can see it's coming from the top right there, and you can see uh, a standard endoscopic bipolar cautery coming in there uh, and cauterizing that uh, bleeder on the side of the side of the cavity there. Here's the final view. Uh, and this, you know, if you like scuba diving, this kind of underwater, clear, serene view is what we're going for and why we named it that. Um, here's the post-up day one CT. And then uh, we've been using automated segmentation for uh, measuring pre and post evacuation volume. So there you go with that. Uh, and here's the gentleman on post-up day four. Um, coming down and uh, talking to a course we were giving on how to do this technique. He was neuro neurologically intact at the time and, and left shortly after. So we published our first hundred patients um, 
And our evacuation percentage, as you can see in the bottom on the mid right there was 88% here. And I think the most important result from this um, was really that our rebleeding rate was very low. Our rebleeding rate was, uh, we only had five patients in that entire group rebleed. And I think the reason why we we're able to get such a low rebleeding rate um, was because at the end of the procedure, as you could see, you really can see the entire cavity. There's no area of the cavity outside of your view. If you see anything bleeding, it, it causes that uh, fluid to be murky, and then you can address that and, and figure out what's bleeding. So it's uh, the ability to confirm absolute hemostasis at the end of the procedure. We looked at what features in that data set of 100, that first 100, um, predicted a good outcome at six months. This is retrospective, but we're just looking in our, our own data set and seeing what features predict good outcome at six months. A lot of the usual characters here, age, IVH, location, but then we also saw that time to evacuation within our retrospective series appeared to correlate with a better outcome, such that uh, when you look at it, if I can go back here, um, that odds ratio is 0.95. So it seemed that there was a 5% increased chance of a good outcome for each hour past, 5% uh, loss of chance of a good outcome. So kind of similar to thrombectomy in that there's a value to each hour but it seems like the time value is a little bit less in ICH than it is in thrombectomy. Um, and then you might've recently seen a few days ago, uh, we also uh, evaluated, could we use the Myriad as the aspiration device down the endoscope? Uh, and this is uh, fresh in operative neurosurgery. Um, this is a series of 10 patients. Um, and in those patients, sorry, maybe eight patients, um, and in those patients, uh, we were able to get an evacuation percentage of 88.1. You can see that kind of towards the top middle there. Um, and we reached the surgical goal um, in seven of those patients, which was 87.5% um, of the patients. Uh, here's a case uh, demonstrating how to use the myriad down the endoscope. Uh, this is a 78-year-old woman. This is the case uh, presented in that article. Um, she was neurologically, she, she was a very healthy woman, no past medical history. She was actually at the gym biking um, when she had sudden onset of a headache um, and some vision challenges. So she went to the ER, had a stroke scale of two at the time. Uh, we transferred her to our main hospital uh, for uh, monitoring for ICH. The plan was obviously not to do any evacuation with the stroke scale two. Um, but on route, she worsened. Uh, when she arrived, she was doing much worse. She had a stroke scale of 26 at the time, um, and her hematoma expanded. Uh, I think it was approximately 100 cc. I don't remember the exact uh, number. Um, and you can see a spot sign or a few spot signs there on the CTA. Uh, so we did a prone right parietal approach, got her in immediately uh, when she arrived at the hospital. Um, and here's uh, aspiration through the endoscope. Uh, you can see the myriad coming down and just doing some basic aspiration of the clot. Um, and then here you can see the myriad through the endoscope kind of cutting uh, some of the more fibrous clot. And it's really like, it, so when the, when the clot is fibrous like this, I'm sure many of you have experienced this, you can really just kind of cut across very nicely and, and aspirate that out. Uh, here's our post-op CT on the right. There's a sagittal cut of the post-op CT. Uh, and then the MRI, you can see that there was partial resolution of the midline shift, still a little bit there, but she um, did fairly well over time, uh, got it out of the ICU in a few weeks. Uh, and here she is at three months uh, coming back in. Um, there's some audio of her talking here, but she uh, was able to walk independently, um, had a left homonymous hemianopsia, uh, and she uh, had some neglect of her left side, but other than that, she was doing pretty well living at home. I think that's just a demonstration of the value of getting in there early. And I think many of you who have done early evacuations have seen patients probably bounce right back uh, as that woman did. And then um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is surgiscopic evacuation. Some of the advantages here are that you have good visibility uh, with this device. I'm gonna show you exactly what the device is in, on the next slide. Um, you can get good hemostasis um, with the multifunctional cannula that's provided with the device. Um, and just like with endoscopic, as I was showing you, with endoport mediated with endoscopic assist, you can uh, broadly select patients. You can uh, address bleeding in the case, so you can go early. You don't have to have patients who have a stability scan. This is less minimally invasive than MISTI and endoscopic, 
but more minimally invasive than larger devices. Uh, there's less evidence to support. Really, there's only been one video publication so far from our group, no other publications. Uh, and it's a new device that does require some getting used to. Uh, so it requires a little bit more training. Here's what the port looks like. Um, you've got a sheath uh, with a camera on the, on the tip of the endo port. Um, so you can't do the scuba technique. You can't work in a fluid filled field. Uh, you can work in a dry field. Um, and then you've got the camera and this device in one hand and you've got your evacuator in the other hand. Here's the evacuator. It's a multifunctional uh, device that has aspiration, irrigation, more solation with the spinning whisk in the tip there that you can see and then cautery. Here's a video of uh, kind of what you see through the device uh, in the case. You can see that you can kind of grab or more slate clot. Um, pretty good visibility. And then here's just a, you hit play on that if it, it's a video of, uh, of the device cauterizing that, that vessel you can see there. That's okay. There you go. All right, so there are two ongoing studies. I would not say the first one's a trial, it's a registry. Um, and then there is a trial uh, ongoing in Australia funded by the Australian government evaluating early evacuation with this device within 12 hours. And then there's a future RCT for the US planned uh, to be funded by Integra. The two studies ongoing, here are some of the details. Um, both of them are really recently initiated uh, and not close to completion. So here are all the questions. We have answers, uh, preliminary answers to some of these, but it's really gonna take the ongoing trials uh, such as Enrich uh, and the work of many people in this room uh, and many other people across the, across the globe to figure out these answers, but we're getting there. So thank you very much for having me speak.